Proč to bylo jiné? 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 Tak jsem ještě ten tenký star nějak dokopal, tak myslím, že máme dost toho. No. To si si nedal. Nedáme pilu na čelo, no. Sorry, ale bezpečně. Můžeš tam lepět někam, kde na čelo. Na čelo? No, no, no. To je vše volontýr stále jako v přednášející. Ano, přesně tak to tady bylo na vrchu. Určitě pouze to bylo To bylo pěkný no, věc, to je, I když člověk jako to začne postupně přepisovat a teď se mu to všechno rozjede. No, ale pak když si tak na to, tak je to fakt pohoda. No, co Jirko, nakonec to stáhl? Uh, nakonec jsem to nerozjel, ale už jsem to překompiloval. A <laughs> jasně. To zní úplně jako cečko. No tak je zvíček, na začátku jsem dlouho přemýšlel, ale když je vlastně... To mě nejde, já to nemůžu dát stopit svůj číslo, protože fajt cečku to nejde. Zvíček, jak to nejde, ale co nejde si počká. Ono to jde různými způsoby. Zvíček, co jsem si říkal, že můžu použít na pěry. Na pět. Ale nechci se to nám pět, protože... No, tak ono tady má ten úplně. Ale když se to pokud jsem pořád, tak jsem to pořád. Tak jako tady prostě to bylo, bys si mohl nastavit statické pole velikosti 100 a věděl bys, že tam... Ty máš to? Pojď to, to je to. Já tak vždycky. Vždycky k tomu bylo, máš si to udělat, tak to bys těl, že to bylo na pět. Jo a nějaký pole, Jinak jako s tím asi uvěc, potřebuješ to vymůžnout od nekaď. To funguje bajíkou, myslím. A co je to za komentovat? No, to tady museli dáno přepnout prvě, ale jinak... Co to můžeš to ovládat, ne? Když jsem se nechal nebrát, tak je to normálně... Počkej, teď je to normálně... A to mohlo funguje, takže tam strčíš vás do toho odpravdáčky. Jo, jasně, jenomže tam bylo právě... Já jsem si vypsat asi všechno. Jaj? Pane, 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 je tam dostatečně velký limit na velikost toho No, to bylo stream toho. Jsme si říkali, co tam je, 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 co je to rozhodně lepší, než to psát v tečku, to stopu na tečku. Já to volontýr. Zbavoval, takže to tak je. Leda, já bych to dal maximálně přítopný. Ne, to tady To tady nebylo. Čau. A jdeme dragou. A já pod příslipem, že už jsem tady naučil. Jen to odsunáš, to je dobrý. No vy chcete na něco jít pak, ne? Začněte asi. Ještě se nezačíná, kolik je? Čtyřicet. Za půl minuty nebo něco? Já se zpět zatím. Já vlastně tady nechám. No to je někdo vůbec. Ty jsi někdo kromě nás? Tak to mám všechny ty své osoby, jestli já nebo se nám někdo někdo vystřídá. To spíš jenom představ, a pak jsme jsme vzhledem tam představili. No, jako takhle. So like, no one's coming or whatever. Um, so basically, like the idea is uh, mastering the Anaconda installer of the of this of this workshop is like we get the Anaconda developers in the room, 
we get some other non-Anaconda developers in the room. And we talk about topics we think are interesting about the, the installer and not very well covered of, often with uh, documentation or like people may not even know they are there. So they might be using the Anaconda suboptimally sub because they just don't know about the features and what, how they can be used. Also the idea is that basically you should really ask about stuff, give, give us feedback, like tell us what issues you have with the stuff we cover or with random stuff you used in Anaconda. So basically, yeah, it's not really a workshop in the sense like you install stuff or improve the installer, but we can talk about it. Um, yeah, okay, hi. So we prepared, basically like we sent an email to some people who use Anaconda, the, Ina the Anaconda installer. We got no reply, so we like just discussed some topics that we think are interesting about Anaconda and should be covered and we prepared some slides about them. So just ask if you, when we talk, when we don't talk, that's not a problem. So I've randomly selected the Anaconda build in help system slides. So basically since about Fedora 20 or RHEL 7.1 I think, we have a built in help system in Anaconda. So basically, uh, uh, the problem is that sometimes you just have uh, an installation process running somewhere, maybe accessible only o over VNC or, or remote stuff, and that might be the only thing you have at the moment. Uh, you might not even have uh, internet access, or it's not, you know, every, like there is an installation guide you can get, but it's online, and you need to basically multitask. You need to have the installation kind somewhere, then you have the computer when you are where you are installing. So we basically, in cooperation with the guys who do the installation guide, we did a built-in help system in Anaconda in the graphical user interface. So there is a help button in, on every screen, and if you press it, you get the help for the screen. At the same time, this is the, the same thing you the same content you have in the installation guide. So you don't need to, we don't need to maintain two sets of content. That just used to be something like this in, on a single screen and was completely unusable for the custom, spo the custom storage configuration. Now it covers all the screens and I think it works quite nicely. But basically, there out of the screen is the help button. Here. <laughs> <laughs> and you get uh, a window like this. This is the, the yeah, help you use, for example, by GNOME applications and other programs. And this is the content. It looks kind of like where, uh, when you see the, it on the website, it looks similar. There are no pictures, so it fits in the window and it covers the screen you are currently looking in, looking on. Not at the moment, but we would like to add it to the text interface at, at, the, at the same time. Basically, it might need to, to have some variants and stuff, but I, from what I know, the people working on the documentation are open to that. And it should be quite easy technically. Basically, you will uh, run less or whatever until you are done with the documentation and get back to the text interface. Well, basically, yeah, there is a Git repo with the docs. It's all tons of XML. We process it, throw away some stuff that doesn't really fit into our use case, and display with the help. It's currently broken in Rawhide because the help is broken, but we are working on that. Uh, yeah, help in text mode, certainly. Some others already asked about that. Um, also, like, there's the idea that this should be available just like on a system. Like you wake up at three in the morning and like decide, I really need to learn about the custom scope. So you don't need to start an installation for that or open your web browser. Basically like the Yelp has some like built-in documentation index. 
Another thing is translation. The problem is no one translates the installation guides at the moment. But if someone does that, yeah, then we are ready for that. It's the localization is built into the system. We just need the content somewhere. Yep. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> it works. So yeah, so that's the help stuff. I think next should, should, where should go next because he has some another talk in like a few minutes or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Um, or I can do another one. No, no, no. Um, is there a browser on that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Then I will redirect my son, I guess. But it has like 2,000 tabs. So no, not just <laughs> yet. <laughs> as long as I can have one more. Um, <laughs> I can't. Oh no. Where's board? the slash? Mm. <laughs> 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 there we go. Hey, good. <laughs> oh, for the love of nuts. The wrong box. Alright, fine, fine. Are you not. <laughs> I swear to. Oh, really? Keyboards, man. Keyboards. <laughs> <laughs> Why won't it do the thing? Why are you not control? Control L. Why can't I copy and paste? I thought I was good at computers. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> Nobody's gonna believe it. Yeah, because this is this is control and this is function key. Oh. Because like so the Lenovo is stupid. I should have yeah. known that control wasn't control. Yeah. <laughs> or I, I don't like it to the control and function click the key. <coughs> Maybe. There we yeah, go. Yeah, doing something. Okay. Yeah. Hooray. Um, this is a quick overview of the driver updates disk functionality that's in the installer, which is sort of a little known corner of the installer um, because most people don't need it. Um, especially in Fedora, where you're not generally going to want to install proprietary drivers or that sort of thing. Um, so yes, the installer accepts driver updates disks, um, which I'll talk about in a second. And you can use them to load um, updated drivers or other drivers that you, we might not have um, present in the installer during the installation. Um, there's a boot argument or a kickstart command you can use to tell the installer that it will also auto-load from specially named devices. And there's also an interactive menu, which is all text and you can't choose your keyboard type and it's all in English and it will never be translated and never use a non-US keyboard. So I don't recommend that. Um, <laughs> so what is a, a, a DUD, a driver update disk? Uh, it's just a, a ISO image. Uh, it has some special YUM repos in it. Um, they have some extra files in them to mark them as being driver updates repos. They have special RPMs in them. Uh, the RPMs have some extra headers to mark them as being driver updates RPMs. And those RPMs have drivers in them, like kernel modules and firmware and that sort of thing. Um, it does about what you'd expect. The installer, if you give it the right stuff, the installer reads it, it finds, it looks at everything that's in the disk. The disk can contain um, drivers from multiple versions of RHEL or Fedora or whatever. Um, so it looks at everything that's there, finds things that are compatible with the running kernel and installer. Um, and then loads all of those drivers uh, inside the installer environment and also saves the packages so that when you install to the target system, you still have the drivers running. Uh, what, why do you care? Well, um, if you have hardware that isn't supported, maybe um, you're using very fancy new hardware that has disks on an unsupported controller, um, or you need to use an uh, unsupported NIC, to fetch images or whatever during the install, or you just love replacing the default drivers and you can't wait until after the system is installed to do that, um, this is the way to do it. <coughs> yeah, well in Fedora it's not as useful because we generally have very, very new drivers and things like that. It's more important in like RHEL and especially older RHEL releases where they are not gonna, you know, it's five years old now, it doesn't have support for the newest things. So this is a... Mm -hmm. And now it's only supported to test the uh, new uh, technology. Huh. 
<laughs> okay, so you have to use that to support very old, all right, very old driver, or very new. Driver downgrade. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the DDD instead of DUD. Um, so to prepare it, it's basically, you'll get an ISO image from somewhere. Generally, it's from Red Hat. Um, although the equipment manufacturers can, like they have them on their website sometimes, but generally it's actually made inside of Red Hat and we give it to them to give to you. Um, you burn, a C, burn it onto a CD-ROM, or you put it onto a USB key. It has to be at the top level of the file system. Um, or you just put it on the network somewhere. So for whatever. Yeah, good. that was my question. Do you have a condition of how to generate that ISO? Because it's been a while since I used web and update this. But um, we have a point with the fact that I need to update the whole machine uh, without HDMI or VGA or connection or whatever. And I need to um, use the NFT within uh, so how do you remotely inject that into the machine because yeah, you don't have any network access, so you need to inject first that. Well, so if you don't have network access, you probably have USB. Um, it's you, a remote machine, you don't have access, so... Uh, well, there is a trick you can do if you can pixie boot it. Um, no. Then, if you don't have physical access and you can't pixie boot it, how are you going to install anything on it? <laughs> oh, it's easy. I'm just using the PXC kernel in Italy. I just bootstrap Anaconda from a running machine with Sky exec. I reboot the machine on its uh, on own, and the kickstart is injected into the Italy. So can we inject the driver of date into the Italy? Yes. Oh, then I have a solution. Yes. Um, yeah, you can totally do that. Um, I actually don't talk about it here because I'm not certain it's actually supported. It's not no, mentioned it's in the RAL documentation, it works, it works fine. but I'll tell you, you can do it. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the, the other secret method is you can inject it into the initRAMFS. Um, so you tell the installer, you give it either, you know, you boot with inst.dd equals URL, obvious, um, or inst.dd equals hd colon and then a disk specifier. Yeah, you can do dev SDA, don't do that. You want to do something like label equals flash or whatever. Oh, oh yeah, I did put it in here. Okay, I lied, sorry. I am um, right there. The answer to your question was on the next slide. Good for me. Uh, so yes, you can embed it in the initRD and then it will load. Um, and this stuff is, I, I should have had a link here. This is documented in, or it should be documented in the um, boot arguments guide in the Anaconda docs. Um, it'll auto detect if you have a device that has the label, a disk partition that has the label OEM drive. It's the same thing as that, except it just, you don't have to use the boot argument. The downside is if your device does not appear in you get in about half a second, which nearly everything does unless it's really, really slow, um, then it won't get detected. The label so should be for drive or flash? Really on slate, it was the label should be flash. Oh, that's just a, a example. Um, it's whatever the whatever your device is labeled. It could be labeled, you know, hog head or something. And it, as long as you have label equals hog head, it'll find whatever's hog head and it'll load devices off. Of the default label is on drive. Sorry? The default label is for Android. Yeah, exactly. And if it's OEM drive, you don't even have to do it. So there, yeah, as I said, there's an interactive mode. You boot with just plain inst.dd and you'll get a menu. You can pick a block device from the menu and then you pick an ISO from the menu and then you pick which drivers you want to install. I don't know why that was, well, I know why it was needed because large hardware partners demanded that it be there. Um, much of the code for this was written under duress because large partners of Red Hat are like, no, it needs to work like this because that's how we've been installing our systems for 17,000 years. And I'm like, that's a lie, but okay. <laughs> um, so it has an interactive mode, which you can use if you want. Um, yeah, you don't want to know exactly how, <laughs> how it works. There's at least one person in this room who has to know how it works, and I'm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, the code's not pretty, I, I can, it's, it's complicated enough that it's not easy to explain and really you don't need to know how it works, but there you go. Um, best practices, you probably, in general, don't want to use this. Um, it's described in the rel install guide, which does a pretty good job of telling you how you use it. Um, if you want to make your own driver updates, don't do that. Like, get your driver upstream, be a good person. If you really, really have to, um, generally talk to Red Hat, the, there are no public tools. I have never seen the tools that Red Hat uses. I wrote the code to handle it, but I've never actually seen the code we use to make them. So they really don't want you to have it. There is example, uh, a example thing that we use for testing in the Anaconda source, or you can read the Anaconda source to get an idea of what it is that makes everything special if you want this to work. Um, generally, we don't recommend that you do this. You should just get your drivers into Fedora if you're working in Fedora, and if you're working in RHEL, talk to Red Hat and we'll help you out. Um, that's that. If you want to know more, there, or talk to me more, there's ways you can do that. So.
Thank you. Okay, so my name is Radislav Podimek. I'm also a member of the Araconda installer team. And as well, the driver of the disks, um, he's like, he provided a way to extend the in installation environment to some, in some way. And I, with some other colleagues, focused on, on another way to how to extend the installation environment. And in this case, the Anaconda itself. And we called it Anaconda Adons just because we had no better name. And since that time, people are suggesting better names. But they started doing so after we said the name. So I'm, I had a workshop, I think it was two years ago at DEF CON, on developing Anaconda Adon, Adons. So I'm not, going to, I'm not going to repeat myself. But I would more like to show, show you what is the current status and what happened since then. So we have the add-on support. Oh, okay. That was fast. Let me check. Ah, okay, so error keys. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so far it has been, it has been uh, proving itself to be wide enough for complex functionality. So, well, the API is kind of uh, not strict, but quite small and you can, and, and very limited, but uh, turns out that you can do complex things with that <coughs> and you'll see examples of existing add-ons in, in a minute. Uh, it can, of course, be extended by our team if you need it. So, for example, I think it was quite recently there were some requests that some add-on were uh, implemented for CentOS wanted to access the the packaging payload in, in Anaconda and we, we are not currently doing this because so far there has been no reason for that. But it's it's a, quite a simple patch for us. So we can expose these things, but instead of exposing everything and then trying to reduce it somehow when we don't know who uses what, we, we chose the different approach that we only pass the add-ons, uh, the information that we are sure they can use and they can safely use, and then we are adding these things, these extra things on demand. Yeah, the <coughs> API is not 100% stable. We, for example, did a rebase in RHEL 7.2, we changed the API, but it was really, it, all these changes were really, really small and easy, and we helped, helped out the the add-on developers to, to, uh, to include these changes in their sources. There can be three types of uh, add-ons, either kickstart only, or with a graphic user interface, or supporting our text mode. The kickstart support is a must, so there can be nothing that, uh, that is supported in the graphical user interface, but it's not supported in kickstart. So the kickstart support is a must, and then the graphical and text mode extensions are optional. Yeah, so he, I'll go through some existing add-ons. Of course, there's the Hello World add-on. I, I, I wrote as a proof of concept of the add-on support in Anaconda. It provides the basic structure and template for developing other add-ons. And so it happens that it is a starting point of as far as I can tell, probably all the other add-ons. So if I look into the sources of all the other Anaconda add-ons that exist, they have something from the Hello World add-on in them. So it turns out that it's probably a good starting point. And of course, we use it for testing, because as we do changes, add-ons, of course, may stop working. So the Hello World add-on is, since it's the kind of a reference implementation, 
we use it for testing <coughs> the add-on support. The most complex add-on so far is the OSCAP add-on. It, yeah, it was written by me as part of my uh, master's thesis in the university, and it's basically an integration of Anaconda and the OSCAP tool for for scanning your system with the ASCAP content for security issues and and configuration issues. It is included in the RHEL 7.2 installation images, so all RHEL 7.2 installations have this available. So it's an example of a successful project, I think, kind of. <laughs> and it's quite extensively tested and maintained, because once it get, once it started to be used in the RHEL installation, the Red Hat Quality Assurance team jumped on it and found many, many bugs and little tweaks that I kept fixed. I kept, I, I still keeping fixing. <laughs> well, another add-on is the KDAMP add-on, add -on, and it is the replacement of the first boot KDAMP plugin because we don't really like first boot. It is an ancient tool that we want to get rid of, and so we are trying to move everything from first boot to either Anaconda or our new tool that is called Initial Setup, which uses. Uh, the same, I would call it toolkit as Anaconda, and you can actually write a, an add-on that is capable of running in Anaconda and in both Anaconda and Initial Setup. So this is a replacement for the KDAM plugin. It was originally <coughs> authored by our team member David Che, who was present on my workshop on how to how to write Anaconda add-ons, and so he wrote one on the way back home and it's now the KDAMP add-on. It uses uh, a new feature which are the head header options. In a kickstart file if you want to use an add-on you type uh, percent add-on and then there is and percent end and everything between these two lines is passed to the add-on. But uh, in some cases it's just easier to use some options so the percent add-on option uh, line also now accepts options like dash dash enable dash dash disable or whatever. So it's an it's an alternative way how to process the data from user in a in a simpler way I think. It has both graphical and text mode versions. And yeah, so it allowed allowed us to drop that uh, ugly first boot screen. Another example of the same is the subscription manager add-on, which is a replacement of again of the first boot plugin. And since these two things were the only two things uh, left in first boot, with these two things moved into Anaconda and initial setup, we can get rid of uh, first boot. Actually, we can get rid of it completely because there are some third-party plugins that we still need to run. But unless there are such plugins, we just skip first boot and. I and it people, doesn't show. People still have them uh, around like seven two. Yeah, I know. I heard about some of them. Yeah, so it runs in the initial setup utility, which runs in the during the first boot, uh, but it has a terrible integration into Anaconda's user experience and UI because it's they basically took the very same UI and just move it from first boot to Anaconda, where the user experience is totally different because we don't use a wizard like model so you are not going sequentially in screens you are you are just doing changes all at once and then then like commit to them so they didn't change anything like that and so far it has only a support it has only support for graphical user interface and it definitely needs more love so if you are willing to volunteer it would be great if you could Make it make it nicer. And most recently, our team member Brian has been working on the Docker add-on. Of course, it has a great potential because it has Docker in it. So, so it's something we have to do. Uh, it allows to set up and run Docker before rebooting into the newly installed system. And you can choose from either from the storage backends. So you can either use LVM thin provisioning or ButterFS or overlay FS. So you can tweet that. 
It is in very early development phase, so the functionality right now is quite limited. But as I mentioned, it has a great potential, and so far it only supports Kickstart. But I think uh, I think the plan for for this add-on is to also do some uh, fetching of the containers and things like that. So you could specify which containers you want to get to your system in a, in a Kickstart, and then you can just install thousands of machines with this, and you will get something like that. Yeah, and. As you can probably imagine, I'm not sure if you know that, but uh, the OSCAP tool now can scan containers, so we can actually combine these two add-ons to like fetch the containers and then scan scan them from the uh, scan them from the other add-on. So it's probably a promising future. Okay, that's all for me about the current status of the add-ons. So thank you for your attention. Questions? Yeah, sure. Is it possible to to bring back to the where in seven or health health seven the possibility to do ask network what was before in your health chat. You mean so now you must know what's your possibility to do in men menu select select network, the computer network. Yeah I don't um Radek can ask answer that. Is it possible to do it in the the uh you mean like in the very early stage like yeah, it's well. It's not possible because actually the add-ons are run in the when An Anaconda starts, so you cannot, for example, yeah. do things er that early to determine from which for which inter uh, through which interface to fetch a Kickstarter or something like that. We don't do any interactive steps in this early stage except for the exactly. You don't want to. <laughs> 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 okay, I may go on actually with one more thing. It's just one slide. <laughs> so it's a very short presentation about Anaconda KExec. You probably know KExec. It's good for testing changes you do to the Linux kernel. But we do it, we, we use it in a different way. You can either specify dash dash k exec when running Anaconda directly, which is uh, not recommended, and nobody should ever do that unless you do some special things, unless you really know what you are doing. Or you can specify reboot dash dash k exec in, in your kickstart. Uh, I checked, and so far it looks like there is no inst.k exec boot option. I don't know, don't know why, actually, but it seems like it's just missing in the code somehow. <laughs> so it should be an easy easy fix if somebody no, needs that. Well, basically what happens is that Anaconda loads the installed uh, kernel and in it are the image at the end of the installation. And then it runs systemctl kexec, which is faster than a full reboot, and but you at the very end of the installation, you get to a freshly installed system, you skip uh, doing the full reboot, so for example you skip BIOS and you skip the bootloader and things like that. But I would say uh, that it's primarily meant for testing purposes. I'm not sure if we are ever going to support things like, okay, if you want to provision your real system really fast, you should do KExec. I think it's more like oh, okay, if you are running tests and then you want to see how the installed system do works, then run kexec and check that. Um, is that option available in the Anaconda version from RHEL 7? I think so. I think it's RHEL 7. It's not recommended anywhere, right? Oh, yeah, okay, let me check. I, well, it's fine. Yeah, I knew kexec, but to bootstrap, I can that setup, which is not from the running system, but I didn't know that I could do that to just avoid the second reboot. So, yeah. Well, I'm not particularly sure. Let me check it, and I'll tell you later. Yeah, if it's if it's not, then it's we can just file an RFE and and, and port it to RHEL seven. It should be quite easy. Yeah, so this was basically the idea. Like, <coughs> there is certainly stuff we just edit because someone asked us, and yeah. could be that like that didn't really propagate to people using Anaconda that we have stuff like this. 
So, yeah, we're up to you. Okay, so like. Okay, so like, yeah, the kind of like hit the question of good options. Okay. No. Yeah, this looks like anaconda good options. Okay, marvelous. No. Hmm. So yeah, uh, Anaconda boot options. Um, we've actually, yeah, uh, not that this. Oh, okay. So <laughs> like this whole, it's it's shoe options actually. Uh, there's a lot of boot options for Anaconda, and it's actually like it's both boot options and not because uh, you can run Anaconda as a program, for example, for. Uh, for live CD, on live CD you just have a running system and you run Anaconda as an application. So it's actually uh, also a command line argument. Just some of them kind of not make sense when running as a plain application and some of them kind of don't make sense running using them as a boot options. But you usually if you look at the arguments you will find out. Uh, 47 of them at the moment. Um, also some like technical stuff really really use the inst prefix if using these arguments as boot options. Otherwise, you can basically collide with other stuff. Like, some, some people might remember the problem with the debug boot option that got consumed by k both kernel and systemd and made the system blow up. So it could be that you can hit something like this because like you do some anaconda mm -hmm. boot option for some reason Kernel, system and whatever might also parse it and like do funny stuff. Uh, we don't enforce this prefix yet, but we will probably do that in the future because it's a good thing to do. The idea to do a separate in space for computer. Yeah. For example, uh, the Draco stuff has the RD something prefix, and it, I think it's like the way to go for most of these tools. <laughs> the only problem could be that on some platforms you have some limitations on, on the length of options and if you do network configuration in uh, yeah okay I do it. so you have uh, bonding configuration there with the JSON uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a, an RFC for file passing kickstarts over boot options like so we kind of rejected it uh, yeah so if you are using it as an application you can do the same stuff but like we call it still boot options uh, yeah, basically the idea is that we would like to point people to this slide, so it has these huge ass links in it. You can get the slides there, we will get it to the conference room guy. So it should be easy to get to these slides and this is the information pointer. So if you want to have a listing of the options per rel or per Fedora or like the upstream ones, get these slides and you get the link. Um, also, Anaconda, uh, all the options are documented, they have help texts. So if you have Anaconda installed, just run Anaconda minus minus help and you will get all 47 options and description for each of them. Um, so basically it's a, lot, it's a ton of options, so I, like, I could be there for an hour and list all of them, but it would be boring as hell. So basically this is what we use when we develop Anaconda and I guess it could be useful for others. We know this work and <laughs> how they work. So for example, if you don't want this annoying welcome screen with selecting the language, set the language via about option and you will get right to the hub. Yeah, updates, uh, stage two, don't use root live whatever for booting stuff. It's it's straight way to hell. <laughs> Basically, it's some crazy Draco stuff, it's not controlled by us and it does nasty things when booting over the network. You don't ever use it. Use inst point stage 2. Otherwise... It's, it's crazy then. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to see the code that in Draco for it. I think it downloads the stage 2 over all interfaces you have on the machine at once find and them in, in more. The everywhere. No. Don't do that. Um, 
Yeah, and debug, for example, it's our debug for int, point debug. Uh, we will eat it also, so kernel will eat it and system we will eat it, don't do that. Yeah, VNC, you can even do VNC connect, so basically you can have a client running as a server locally, and it's kind of handy. And to Anaconda will connect to you, yes? Interesting idea. Because you can install installation and you can start VNC. So then taking VNC through SSH will work for a while. Yeah, it's a great idea, but nobody has ever requested it. Yeah, you want doing remote installation all over the world. Yeah. You can run SSH actually and connect via SSH to the installation. Yeah. So it should not be that difficult. You have you have VNC running in local host only and then you yeah. So yeah, if you want it as, an, as a good option or something, like mm -hmm. certainly file a RFE. Yeah. Of course, already. Because the CPE is running, you can connect with that yeah. client. But you need to do it manually, so it might not be bad to somehow like automate it. I'm not really sure, like at the moment, how exactly, but certainly a good <coughs> idea because like it's really insecure. It's like eight characters password and stuff. Yeah, it no longer sends the, the password in the plain text over network, at least. <laughs> or at least it was not visible in the Wireshark output. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, image creation. If you have the urge to write your own image creation tool, don't do that. We have this stuff and we have it handled. And uh, I think we, we did do it in quite the same way. And usually it's not in the same way if you just like make something together. So please, please use Anaconda for image creation. We know what we are doing in this case. <laughs> and we have tools case. like Lorax and Life, like, what's the name? Call it one. But yeah, it's, it, it's working, please use it. <laughs> um, yeah, with more exotic options, like the exact stuff, right to stuff mentioned. And it's all in the docs, like, uh, it should be at least. If there are any issues with the docs, like it's on, on GitHub, if it's in the rail docs, like file bugzillas, where people from documentation are really, really glad when they get feedback and fix stuff really quickly. Uh, remote logging, turn off SSL if you really want to. Geolocation, there is geolocation since RHEL 7, basically since around ni like 19. Um, you can turn it off if you want to, or set a different provider. Uh, rescue mode, like it does the wonderful thing, it mounts your root and that's it. Well, <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Um, memory check, basically, the funny thing is that if you are doing a network installation, you actually might need more RAM for installation than for the system, because you are living in the RAM before you can, before you format the storage. But if you really think it's incorrect or something, we need to have some margin. You can turn it off with this one. Yeah, um, and we have we have some numbers that are much greater than what we actually need because <laughs> if you have less than what we have in those numbers, the installation is really slow and basically unusable. But it's not impossible. So, for example, you can install Fedora with like I think it was something slightly over two hundred megabytes of RAM, but it's it's really a long long term thing. So. We so need you sometimes need to use the no man check option just to to not anaconda exit early on, on that check even though you can install the system. We already actually do uh, RAM compression and it helps a lot. It basically like lo lowers our memory requirements by half. Like since like the stuff implemented it, just that RAM and some custom stuff. Um, I think that's it, so yeah. Just like read this thing and you'll, you'll learn the, the gist of it. Yeah. So I think Rabbit goes now. Yeah. I checked that the UK exec is supported on Rails and Brand. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's in the document, but definitely on Rails 7.2.
So uh, my name is Radek Vikidal and I'm talking more about development and debugging side uh, about runtime Anaconda updates and I will also touch uh, mm, uh, modifying uh, installer for specific products like uh, Fedora workstation and cyber flavors which is using basically the same technology at the moment. Um, so, we are using uh, runtime updates uh, a lot for debugging and testing and uh, it's, they are especially useful uh, for issues which we are not able to reproduce locally. We, we send updates image to a customer or to a person able to reproduce bug and, and uh, we are kind of de developing remotely in this clumsy way. <laughs> um, and sometimes uh, we use update images also for host fix updates. For example, Fedora common bugs uh, can have a link to, uh, to updates image which fixes the problem early after release. Um, Updates images allows us to um, update the installer without rebuilding. Install images, which are init our image and uh, install uh, installer image itself. And also uh, sometimes without rebuilding Anaconda or Blivet or um, PyKickstart, basically Python um, packages. Um, mm, what's update image? It's a uh, compressed uh, CPIO archive of file system overlay. Uh, we are using uh, updates in, uh, images, updates of uh, initRD, we call it in the initRD overlay, and of the installer image. Uh, the mm, initRD overlay is used um, Mm, for the early uh, stage of installation or uh, where we, for example, uh, fetch uh, installer image, kickstart, driver updates and installer image updates. Yeah, and uh, the updates image, uh, it updates uh, the file system of uh, the installed in environment. Uh, so, the early stage initRD overlay, it's applied on top of initRD root. Uh, example is mm, debugging, parsing, kickstart in initRAMFS. In uh, we do it with uh, this Python script. Uh, it can be used to testing for testing uh, very good patches. Uh, to apply the overlay, you have, well, you need to install with method which allows you to supply initRD, of course, and for PIX installation, you can just add the uh, overlay to the options. Uh, 
I think this works also in Virt, Virt Manager with uh, direct kernel boot. Uh, well, this is just uh, more a convenience thing because you can also re update the init RD directly. Uh, the install image overlays are more interesting. Uh, they are applied during the, the early Drapel stage and they are uh, overlaying root file system. This is true for Rails 7 and Fedora uh, where we are using Dracut uh, for early stage. Uh, in Rails 6 we used to have our, our, our own init and loader binaries. Uh, so yeah, in RailsX the functionality is quite limited basically to updating, updating the installer and perhaps overriding some mm, libraries. Uh, so what are we using the installer image for? Uh, we can update mm, Anaconda uh, without need to rebuild the package, but we can also uh, modify config files. Uh, for example, we are, I am using it uh, often for mm, increasing logging level of network manager, but uh, I think in next two instances we are, we are uh, uh, make, making it uh, default to debug uh, like, yeah, by default. Mm. We can also supply updated RPM package, but then you have to be careful about dependencies of the package. Uh, we have a tool for uh, creating updates images, which uh, has an option to, to, uh, to try to resolve the dependencies and... and yeah, it actually just like checks the, the spec file for new stuff. Yeah. Since the tag you are using for creating the update image, and just fetches that. So it's basically mostly for updating our libraries like Blizzard and Python stuff, but it, it's not introducing new like third like leave dependencies or whatever. It's really helpful, especially for raw high development. And you can well, you can add whatever you want. You can add packages to develop new new features. You can add debugging tools. So how how we uh, configure the updates image to be used? We can use boot options, kickstart command, uh, or you can put updates image in a default loco location in installation repo, or uh, for the uh, initdar image, uh, you can also. Mm, extract the updates image in a default location but this is like not very used so the boot option is in updates uh, the basically the updates image can be uh, fetched in always uh, we we'll, we're talking about uh, driver update disks, so from uh, via HTTP or from a disk device, um, and uh, yeah, that's for boot options. Uh, for kickstart command, uh, it can be fetched via HTTP. The default location is. Uh, in installation tree, it's images updates image or images product image. I will get to uh, this later uh, to the product image. And um, the image can be added to the tree uh, 
during uh, in image build process, which is done by Lorax. If you if you put the content of the image in a specific directory, Lorax will automatically take it and and create the updated product image. Uh, in init RD, you can uh, uh, put the content of updates image in uh, root in updates directory. It's the um, uncompressed image. So, product image. Product image uh, is uh, um, part of installation tree and it's used uh, for product specific modifications. Uh, ba basically now it co contains a style sheet to modify look of the installer and product specific installer code. Uh, it's an install class module, Python module, uh, which uh, the install class Python module has no strictly defined API. It's uh, it's uh, supposed to be to be provided by the uh, spin providers or or product providers. And um, basically, it inherits from Fedora based install class modifies some attributes or uh, adds some. Uh, Override some uh, methods, but uh, as I said, there is no no like really defined API. The modifications uh, we do in uh, which which are done in a uh, um, product specific install classes now are style sheet to be used. Default file system, for example, Fedora uh, server is uh, using XFS. Uh, default software selection, of course, and uh, it can be also default partitioning, which is uh, done in a Fedora Atomic Spin. Yeah, as I said, uh, mm, the the product image is uh, packaged in a Fedora product image uh, package, and this package is included in uh, kickstarts for composing uh, Fedora spins. So in the Kickstarter, we exclude uh, other packages and include the, the package for the product. Um, what the package contains, the product image package. It's uh, the content of product image, the Root over root file system overlay is uh, located in user share Lorax product path, and this is the default location which Lorax picks and uh, uh, then generates images product image in the in the tree. So. Uh, for creating updates images, you can do it manually, like whatever, whatever you want. But uh, for the development and also for um, also for other cases, you can use the script script we provide in in our Git. It's make update script, and it has a few of options. Uh, Basic, uh, basic functionality is just to update, to make updates image, which uh, mm, 
updates the code uh, relatively to some git tag. And it, it has also an option to add RPM and, uh, as I said, uh, to add RPM dependencies uh, inferred from the from edit RPMs. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Any questions? Hey, now I'm going to do a lot. Yeah. You know, you must break, uh, break your slides a few minutes before the presentation. So, hi, my name is Tiri Konečný. First of all, sorry for my English. I'm trying to get better, but it's not that good at, uh, as I want. It's sometimes good to do it a hard way and you get used to it. I hope this won't hear my uh, manager. <coughs> so, I want to do some uh, little research before. Is here uh, someone from the QA testing or from group which is testing Anaconda? Anyone? Yeah, that's sad. <laughs> we hoped this will be a mainly presentation for them. So, how many of you did use Anaconda? I think all. Yeah. And how many of you did use uh, GUI? GUI for the Anaconda, graphical using inter user interface? Yeah. You are you don't use it? Oh really? Okay. So I hope I should skip the first slide, but <laughs> then. So um, in graphical user interface, you have a uh, few options how to uh, how to uh, create your partitions and how to prepare your installation, your disk, and so on. So first is auto part which is also into a text user interface. Uh, that will automatically, somehow, some automatically, I think, more, uh, create, uh, prepare your uh, free space, and it will create a uh, swap, uh, and it will create a uh, root partition, and so on. And it should work without any, any user interaction. But, if you want something more, uh, you need uh, you need to do uh, to go to custom spoke. Custom spoke is somehow uh, creation. <laughs> it's like Gparted, but not with the similar options. Uh, you can uh, can specify where uh, your partition will be. It will take the first uh, available free space where it could be and uh, so on. So you will create your root partition, your boot partition swap, and any, anything you want, no problem. Uh, problem is it has its weaknesses. As I said, uh, uh, when you using custom spoke, it takes first available space, which is not that quite, quite what user want somehow, sometimes. Uh, also, uh, it's uh, when you have ButterFS or LVM with snapshots or something like that, you can have plenty of those, and it's uh, not really uh, too e so easy to remove all snapshots or so on. You must click one by one. So uh, this will be this presentation will be more peek into the future. I will show you uh, what will be in the custom spoke in F uh, Fedora 24 and also what will be in the custom spoke in far future, uh, but I, do, I, thought, uh, I think it won't be too far. So, 
And here's what it can do. Uh, I can scroll it with this. Yeah. Uh, what what you can do in the in the uh, custom spoke now? So you can uh, take what uh, what format do you want? If you want LVM, uh, we have there we had there a butterfs, but I think we removed it because it was, okay. it's, it's still there. But not like. I think it's still there. Yeah, really? Okay. I know there were, there was too many problems with it, but it's possible it's still there, I know. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's it's really nice if you need to work somehow with the LVM. Uh, the LVM cache is implemented already. Um, I'm not sure it's, if it's in the UI. Yeah, it will be. It will be. It's wor uh, um, Bratislav's works uh, on the LVM cache uh, implementation, so it will be here to in the future, or maybe it's it, uh, it's in Fedora 23 too. I am really don't know now. <coughs> so uh, that's how it looks now. So new features. Uh, okay, there's a weekend sys. Sorry, I, I said this, said that all already. So new features. Uh, for new Fedora, uh, there will be multi selection. Um, it should be easy if this will be some standard, uh, standard, uh, how it's called, uh, some standard uh, uh, graphical. Item graphical interface, but uh, it's our accordion. It's called, and it's it's it mean this means uh, to rework uh, about half of it. Because yeah, it's it wasn't quite well implemented. And yeah, GTK unfortunately is not flexible enough yeah. for the stuff we need here. True. So, yeah. So. <coughs> It will be it to have uh, control uh, control selection shift selection so it should be easy to uh, remove your all your all of your snapshots and so on uh, with this multi selection. But in the far future, uh, there should be third option as a new, which is uh, blivet GUI. Uh, you can use it uh, now as a uh, as, a, as, a, as a program in Fedora. It's it will be integrated uh, to the Anaconda, and should it should look like this. <coughs> it's somehow uh, similar to the Gparted. You can do uh, do here uh, the problem. You can uh, ring. Uh, here are removed the problems uh, which uh, was before, like you have uh, 500 megabytes of space before the partition because I want, uh, I don't know, give here, give here my coded binary data or whatever. So uh, it should be possible and uh, I hope it will be in Fedora 25, but I don't know now because it's uh, too much work to done. So basically, it's the like the current custom spoke is like top down. You just send I want an, an amount point on LVM this big, and it does automatically a lot of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. But some there are cases where people do want the, the different thing, and that's Vivid GUI. Exactly. Combine all the small all the block devices, LVM, LVs, and everything. So basically, some people want the new stuff. Some people would like to have this thing. So basically, you are going back to what you, we had in the past with Anaconda, like in Fedora 12 or Red 6, but you had the visual too. Yeah, so but going back to what we are, we had before. Well, it's, it would be like a, the third option, like you have AutoPart, you yeah. have the custom spoke, and not a a bit, with not a basically. Yeah, because before people said like this is too complicated, you should do something more yeah. less complicated. So, so you have now three options. You, you never will like make friends in all users. So yeah, it's hard. Uh, that would be all, that will be all from me. Uh, do you have some questions? Okay, so please leave feedback. Maybe you can convince my other team members 
to not let me go here again. <laughs> Thank you. I think the, the most important thing at the moment is to ask the session chair, what's our time? Are we already, already out of time or <coughs> no, we, have, we still have 25 minutes? Oh, my, my. 25. Okay. So basically, like, we have still some topics and I think it would be the best to basically ask you which one of them you want to, to have. Um, when I figure the browser thing, yeah, okay, another path, nice. Um, okay, so we have, we had boot options. Uh, we have um, basically a, a, a presentation covering the kickstart. It's an overview about the kickstart format, just the things you can do with it. Um, we have an, uh, slides about uh, the Anaconda development, how Anaconda is developed and how you can contribute to it, where you found, can find the source code and which different components are there for Anaconda. And then uh, we have uh, slides from Radek about network configuration about how you can configure the network in Anaconda. And I think that might be like what we have at the moment. Uh, well, the logging slides are like usable or, yeah, we have some slides about logging in Anaconda. They are not like, <coughs> they are like alpha, let's say. <coughs> so we have, Kickstart, slides about Kickstart, slides about Anaconda development, and slides about uh, network configuration in Anaconda, so... Okay, so let's welcome Radic again. Sorry, so I, I would like to uh, speak about supported ways, uh, some workarounds and tips uh, about configuring network in very good stage and Anaconda stage of installation. Uh, it's all about if config files. We are just um, working with, with info, if config files, creating configuration uh, in uh, these files and copying them to the installed system at the end of installation. Uh, I can mention device types we support uh, for uh, various types of installations and some limitations. Uh, so the installer uh, is running two stages, Jacob stage, Anaconda stage. We, we might need to do network configuration in the stage, early configuration, and, uh, mm, and we can configure network also after switching to install environment. Uh, as for the, this is the configuration of uh, install networking. The uh, network configuration of target system, as I said, is basically the same as the configuration in its installer with some uh, some uh, uh, small differences. I will talk about it later. Uh, we are also configuring network in initial setup. Uh, it's uh, it was added recently because of uh, the uh, subscription manager uh, add-on add it to initial setup. Yeah. But for example, if someone installs from the DVD, the network is not act automatically activated. So the system will not have any network configured. And of course, subscription manager like needs to contact the subscription servers. So we added the network scope to the initial setup. Yeah, and, and it's, it's kind of uh, rough at the moment because we had quite a lot of assumptions about install install environment yeah. and now we are using the network in configuration GUI in on target system, which uh, is yeah a more complex environment. 
also the task of humanity people really need to integrate better with the Anaconda networking stuff because at the moment they don't check if they have network, so that should be hopefully fixed in the next version of the add-on. The Anaconda is run also in environment uh, in a live city or live city environment. Then there we just step back and let user use uh, the environment tools, which have better support for, for, for example, for wireless. And basically, we, we don't want to try to screw to to like step over this configuration. And uh, also, we are uh, running Anaconda for image installs. And then we just don't want to touch system configuration. So yeah, so then uh, the the option to configure the the networking in the image if it's required is basically the post kickstart script and doing it like creating a config files manually. So early early configuration in Dracut. Uh, we we are configuring network in Dracut to to fetch installer image, it updates image, driver updates, kickstart, and uh, also uh, the we are configuring network in very good stage if boot options are preferred prefer, preferred way of configuring uh, network for various reasons. The boot options uh, are just very good uh, options. We, we still uh, support the uh, old days anaconda options we we translated them in uh, dracut options and uh, it they are still working but the preferred way they are deprecated and preferred ways to use just dracut uh, ip configuration uh, there is uh, uh, some um, aspect of this which is uh, quite tricky uh, or, or users sometimes stumble upon it uh, and that's the default uh, configuration. Uh, Dracut by default uh, tries uh, DHCP on all devices which, has, which have link uh, which is yeah which is sometimes a problem. And currently the only way to prevent this is supply the device you want to install, uh, to you want to configure, or and it's either via just via Dracut IP option or via boot if option for Pixie installations. Uh, during kickstart, uh, we process uh, kickstart configuration. Uh, config network configuration in kickstart is done with a network command. Um, uh, in Dracut, we, we translate the kickstart network configuration into if config files, uh, but the, this configuration is applied only after switching to to install install a root. Um, the ex exception is uh, uh, if you don't activate networking uh, with boot options, or um, yeah, with boot options, then the configuration from Kickstart is applied. So it is. Uh, when Kickstart is not fetched over network, uh, but uh, from USB stick from 
uh, device or inject it in initial FS, for example. So, uh, in Draco stage, if config files are created based on kickstart configuration, and Draco also creates if config files uh, for uh, connections or configuration. Draco sets up it's with uh, Draco module write if config. Um, If you want to uh, play with if config files before um, uh, switching to installer root for some reason for testing or debugging, there is a, a, a way we are using to test stuff. Uh, you can supply a Draco option to stop to get shell before switching to installer root and uh, you can edit if config files which are at this uh, path so what happens after switch root uh, network manager is started and it's it starts in parallel with uh, anaconda we for example we don't wait for network manager to become online which uh, sometimes leads to race conditions and uh, like we'll have to work on this. Uh, network manager takes over connections activated in, in, in Idram FS and uh, if the, for example, kickstart configuration, if config files uh, created based on kickstart configuration uh, are different from the config of device uh, created in Draco. It applies these changes, these if config files. Uh, now, uh, it's possible that there are also devices which uh, don't have any if config in, don't have any configuration, and we need to handle this somehow. Uh, in uh, on workstations, or if the network manager server package isn't present, uh, network manager uh, creates default auto connections for devices without if config files. Um, so, in installer, we then dump this configuration into if config files. When this uh, auto connections are not created, uh, we create default if config files. So basically, we create, we assume that every device has if config file uh, during installation and after installation. Yeah, as I said, kick, if config files uh, based on kickstart are applied by a network manager after switch root. Uh, there is a bit different situation. If you define your networking uh, in pre-kickstart session, like dynamically, uh, it, like you create your configuration dynamically based on, I don't know, sniffing the system, uh, then uh, the configuration is created by Anaconda calling network manager, network managers Bbus API. So here we, like, here Anaconda creates the connections. In other cases, it's just network manager picking up the if config files. Then there is GUI and TUI. Uh, 
network configuration. Uh, we have a standalone install or um, UI very early uh, GUI, your GUI screen, uh, which prompts for configuring a network if, if, uh, if we detect that it's a network installation. And then we have a network screen just on the uh, main hub. Uh, we are calling Network Manager Connection Editor to create configurations. We are running uh, this tool and uh, mm, wrapping it in some UI just for mm, turning devices on and off and listing devices, displaying configuration of devices. Uh, there is, if, if um, for debugging or for various reasons, for adding uh, uh, something we don't support in our wrapper, you can start a an, uh, network manager connection editor uh, from the shell, from terminal, from TTI2. Uh, as for text user inf interface, the configuration is limited to Ethernet devices, uh, for um, other configuration like bonding, gone, uh, other complex, uh, other virtual devices, uh, it, NMCLI, uh, network manager, command line client can be used in uh, shell in TTY2. And installer should survive. Uh, creating connections uh, with this tool. And in text UI it should also uh, display uh, the devices if they are activated. Uh, IBF different configuration. I don't know if it's interesting for you. I think I can skip this one. Um, and so, as for the configuration of target system, as I said, we just copy if config files to the target system. Uh, so, the way to uh, to have a different configuration in installer in a, and in a target system is uh, activating. Uh, a device with uh, install configuration via boot options and then uh, overriding if config file uh, via kick start. And yeah, so the kick start shouldn't be applied, the kick start configuration overriding the, the um, device configuration, unless you supply activate option. In this case, uh, it is also applied in installer. Or you can uh, change the configuration in GUI, but uh, in Fedora, actually, uh, we are also applying the change configuration, which is uh, debatable. But uh, yeah, we we heard to a request to do that. Mm, another option relevant to target system configurations on boot option, uh, which uh, which tells if the device should be uh, auto auto activated or the connection should be auto activated after reboot. Uh, it's uh, also uh, debatable stuff and we are imposing some on boot policy in installer, uh, for example, for Fedora, if you install without networking, we enable a device with link we find uh, for reboot, so we set on boot to yes for this device. 
we are also generating uh, dry codes configurations uh, for uh, uh, network storage for iSCSI, for example, or root on iSCSI. So, to uh, to uh, create the configuration for target system needs to be created uh, in installer. So you can, you, for example, you cannot uh, create a configuration for device with name that is not at the system at the moment of installation. So, for example, when generating cloud images, you just it's how Fedora spins are doing that. They just drop completely manually created if config so if config file to the to the right place. As for supported <coughs> device types, uh, we support Team Bond, VLAN and Bridge in boot options, Kickstart GUI. As I said, these are not displayed in, uh, they, they are not uh, supported in text user interface. Uh, the workaround is to use NMCLI in, in shell, in terminal. Uh, as for wireless, uh, it can be configured in GUI, uh, but not where kickstart, not with boot options. We used to support it uh, at some point, but um, it, the, the functionality was removed and no one asked for it. So. But for workstation, you can, uh, for, for example, for Fedora workstation, you can configure wireless easily in live environment. But you should do it before starting the installation. Some selected limitations. Yeah, the the same configuration in installer and target system, no option to, to um, create configuration specifically for target system. Uh, auto apply of config change in GUI, that's what I was talking about. It can be limiting for some user cases. Uh, we are, yeah, we are not uh, passing configuration of, stati of static routes to target system, but it, I think we will fix it soon. And yeah, a network manager and Anaconda starting as services in parallel uh, are causing race conditions uh, with detecting if uh, um, networking is available at some in some cases. So we need to work on this too. Can I just add another good point in the slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The ATH tool option has been removed a long time ago, meaning that at the moment, if you are web remoting from a machine in a VC where the switch is misconfigured and fixed to 100 megabits per, uh, per second, four, maybe, the network manager will just try negotiation and they don't add any option at, uh, at all. So your machine is going back to 10 megabits R duplex or, yeah, 10 megabits R duplex. So you think it would be a good idea to have Anaconda uh, add the option back? And what was that? If you configure the, when you configure the interface at the moment, Rakuk can't do it, and Anaconda has the option to set the speed and duplex setting for uh, an uh, If auto negotiation fails, which happens quite a lot, because there are a lot of switches in misconfigured in the, in the world, um, it takes age to and I have the I have the I have the because of that. Because the network manager was trying to configure the interface. And I got that right. At the time, also, we don't have any crash. Uh -huh. And so we don't know the I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but there's another round of workshops yeah. starting here in 10 minutes, so we can finish the discussions outside. There are, yeah. there are also places. 
Yeah. 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 Basically, slides should be also there. I'm giving it then to the session chair. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually blocked about it in the future. So. Well, yeah. Thanks for coming here. <laughs> and and I, I hope it will be at least somehow useful for you. Let's put them. 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 Let's put tam je nedělej, je to mě tam sandej. Já to sečka, jsem rozdávat Já ti to tam dám všechno a to už se nevyznáš, ne? Nebo počkej. Pomůžem s něčím? Já tak, 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 Pryč, pryč, pryč. Mám hlavu, když škola Jo. Možná ti tam je něco zbyde na té flašce. Aha. Možná ti tam je něco zbyde po tom vázání na té flašce. Co, já to já nevím, já jsem, já jsem tu flašku dostal dneska do ruky. Ale jo, jo. Jo. Jak to mě zmaště, to si vás. Ale si to bude co okazí. Ale jsem se hnalo zvolila. Co, počkej, já to dostal dneska prdé, já jsem to dostal do ruk. Ty nemáš už žádný ty. A co se ty na sladě? Ne, jo, to je ta nastavení. Více ty html ty obrázky prostě, to je jako že... A jak z toho vygenerovat to devko? To je nějaký ten, to je nějaký ten... No, teoreticky otevřeš si prostě, ty html věci si otevřeš. No to já vím. A uděláš to pdf, normálně v Firefoxu.